Good morning. Monica, can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody today? <laughs> it's well, I've got coffee, so that's a start. <laughs> right. Yeah, boy. Yeah, I didn't start drinking coffee till I was 50 years old. Really? Oh, wow. That is correct. Um, I, like I, still I was drinking it. leftover cold coffee when I was like three. <laughs> um, my dad, when seriously, when I was a kid, my my dad wouldn't let us drink coffee. He never would. Um, he said a, a man that drinks coffee is not worth as much, as, but a, uh, <clears throat> a half of somebody else who doesn't, because you're always taking breaks, um, and you you know you. You're not a self-starter. You have to. You stand around till you get your coffee, and then you have to take coffee breaks. And no smoking, no coffee drinking, um, because you just, you know, you was always trying to smoke or wanting to smoke, or figuring out when to smoke. Uh, he just said that in the in the in the business world, that people who smoked and drank coffee just just wasn't worth wasn't worth the trouble. Seriously. <laughs> and so, oh no, 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 no coffee in his house, no, no cigarettes, no smoking. Of course, we were fundamental Baptists as well, but, but he was talking about from a business sense, not, not about religion. Yeah. Um, you know, especially in a business where you have to use your hands. Um, no. And so, uh, I didn't start drinking coffee until the doctors made me. Uh, and that's a long story, but I still have to put enough stuff in it so to try to disguise the taste because I'd rather drink out of a mud hole. Um, but uh, it was either that or some other things, and so I, I picked the coffee. Okay. <laughs> uh, after you, if you've had, if you've had your spine worked on, you know what I mean without being graphic. Mm. So, when I had my last big spine surgery. The doctor said, you're either going to have to go on medication or you're going to have to start drinking coffee, one or the other. I said, I'll take the coffee. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I love the taste of coffee. That's wrong. I don't get it. But that's another, that, that's another story for another day. Um, <laughs> what I was thinking about this morning is, um, I think Dr. Scarlett has joined us. What I was thinking about this morning is the coronavirus. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. Good morning. The last, the last email I picked up last night when I got through grading was from Dr. Downs. And he just followed up, the president of the college. He followed up on his comments from the faculty meeting yesterday, which echoed mine from earlier in the week um, at, I don't know, I'm trying to think, Dean's chair meeting, I guess it was, that we need to get in front of those of us who go to alternative campuses, those of us who go to public schools, those of us who have clinicals in public schools, um, or how people from all over come to a central location need to start getting some plans in place um, for for that time. And so um, um, I'm I'm thinking that um, you know, we have some folks who work, and I know Rod works in public schools. I'm, I'm, um, those kinds of things, and then where we meet in Charlotte is a concern because of the, the you know, the, the size and the people coming through and being in Charlotte. Now, the president said yesterday, and I don't want to contradict him, he said there's been no confirmed cases in North Carolina. Um, my understanding, there was two. Uh, people who were quarantined and came, flew out of China. They're not in Charlotte now, but they came through Charlotte and, and they have, you know, came from China and, and were put through the 
at the airport, if, when somebody comes in like that, they don't come through the baggage claim and everybody else. They put them, they took them through the side door and, and quarantined and medically quarantined them and moved them back to their home. But there were two people who came through Charlotte. So I think he's right. But yes, uh, ha ha living here, uh, it was all over the news here. So I don't want to contradict him. But there have been two confirmed cases that came through Charlotte that flew back from China. But they were medically they were medically quarantined when they came. They flew in. So So are are we still meeting on March seventh and eighth? Yes, we are. That's where I'm headed with this long winded soliloquy is mm -hmm. um, the university has not they just said be cognizant, be aware. Um if you <clears throat> um they're mostly concerned about after spring break when it warms up, students traveling mm -hmm. and all that. Right now, uh, you know, we're pretty much okay right now because it's still getting under, you know, less than, it's, it's temperatures dropping below freezing on a fairly regular basis now. As soon as spring break comes and, and the warm up happens, um, that's when we're going to get concerned. So our concern is gonna be for our May last meeting in May. That's gonna be our concern. Um, so, thinking about that and, and talking with uh, the Dean this week in the Deans and Chairs meeting or whatever we're called, um, we're going to be fine in that we will just use Zoom in May if we have to. Um, we're not to that point yet. Um, no confirmed cases in Charlotte. There's two that, the two that came through, but they were in medical quarantine when they came through. And so there's not a public health crisis yet. But if we have cases, this is kind of the benchmark for me. If we have cases in North Carolina, confirmed cases, quarantined or not, then we're going to go to Zoom for our last, for our May weekend. Uh, we will meet this coming next week, week from today. We will meet in Charlotte. We're still on for that unless something comes up this week. The president did not, he said, you know, business as usual until further notice. And that was, you know, make some plans, be prepared, be, be aware. We've got plans, we've got makeup and stuff, but all that was already built in our calendar. The only thing is, I just need for you to know, the possibility is that, that when we meet in May, it's, there's a better than average chance that we will meet by Zoom with our last weekend. And that's our presentation weekend. And so um, we'll only have about a half a day that Saturday where we'll do program evaluation because this weekend we're going to get through quantitative on Saturday with Dr. Scarlett and qualitative with me on Sunday. Um, and so we should be good. And if I have to, we'll compact that. And so the last weekend, the bulk of it is your presentations anyway. We can just turn it over to you because we are practiced already in doing our presentations online with our case okay. study. We okay. Should, we should be in good shape. Okay. And so if I hear anything this week, please be monitoring your email. I'll put it out quickly. I'll, I'll go to the class email. I'll go to regular email. I'll, I'll do blast this week if anything changes before next weekend. But as of last night, the president said we're still on. But if that changes, but after after spring break, we're going to go to a different level of, of awareness after spring break. Um, so right now we're good. So with that in mind, everybody welcome. Let me do my share and let's go to our weekly schedule. Because I've got pulled up here somewhere. There it is. So as a reminder, this weekend you're at home, we're doing our case study data gathering. Next week we're in Charlotte. Saturday is completion of quantitative. Sunday is the um, completion of the qualitative with Miriam. Um, I'm still here. Um, and then, um, the following weekend, we resume our normal schedule, and then um, 
we'll do uh, after the weekend after we meet <coughs> is spring break. Then we'll go on to a, a different heightened level of awareness with the university and we'll be at home uh, March 21st. We'll do our last case study giving feedback and then uh, you'll continue on with discussion boards. Uh, and then the week of April 6th through 12th is Easter break. After Easter break, we'll go on an even higher level of awareness. So that's why I said there's a good possibility when we get to that point that we may we may stop doing external classes to the university. At that point, um, if we if we can, we'll continue on and, and meet for our last weekend, which is May 2nd and 3rd in Charlotte. But uh, I have a sneaking suspicion by then we'll be online, but we're, we're prepared for that, so everything will be fine. And then you can see that that will conclude us other than you take your the 20 question final exam. All right, so that's that's our schedule the rest of the way. Um, we're, we are monitoring what's going on um, to try to keep everybody safe. So that, that's where we are this morning. I do want to say that next weekend, at some point on Saturday, um, it's probably going to be lunch or after lunch. Dr. Hamilton is going to be with us. Uh, I believe he is the, uh, I believe Dr. Hamilton is your consultancy coach. Um, and so he has made arrangements to be with us. I think he said he wanted to be there for lunch slash after lunch. Um, I tried to call him a few minutes ago to get a more specific time, but let's just say he'll be there at 12. He'll be there sometime between 12 and 1. Uh, to work with you and so we're going to squeeze that in as well next weekend just in case he can't come later uh, he's going to come he's going to come this weekend so if you've got some things in consultancy that you need him to see uh, I'm giving you the one week notice you need to kind of get that together for him for next week if, you, if you've got questions on your consultancy where you are um, you know we're doing uh, our milestone, let me go back and do a share. We're doing milestone six this semester. So make sure if you've got things that you need to ask him or me, since that's qualitative and quantitative projects, we'll meet together with you uh, next weekend to answer any of those questions that you have or look at any of the work that you're doing, or um, if you if you need help on your consultancy um, next weekend, be prepared for that on Saturday. <coughs> Plans, we've moved that timetable up just in case we don't get to meet that last weekend and he does want to meet with you face to face this semester. All right, so I will pause. Anybody have any questions on anything I've covered so far? All right. So, you had three options on your, your case study this week. Um, those three options were posted in materials as well. You were to reflect on your experience designing interview questions, you know, keeping in mind um, both <coughs> validity and reliability. Um, you were to pick one of the three cases, three, four, or five, uh, that were on in our case study materials, um, and follow the follow the process of designing questions, conducting the interview, and then you had these dis discussion questions to answer. So let's get started this morning. Um, who uh, who wants to get us started? I'll make you the host. Let me let me stop my share. And go to participants. All right, who's going to who's going to start us off this morning? Our team can go first, I guess. All right, thank you, Monica. Volunteer us. All right, I have made you the host. Let me 
me stop my video. That always helps. So just look, there you go. And then, um, Jeff, do you want to get us started since you've got the first part? Jeff, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Perfect. We can hear you. Okay, sorry. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, start with a little bit of uh, background for this particular case. And um, we chose, uh, I think it's case four. It's about the multicultural mm -hmm. uh, community connection, also known as MCC. It's a nonprofit organization um, in the South. Um, they uh, work with uh, the community and teachers to uh, foster community building, diverse population of students in the Lakeland community. Um, it is uh, led by Olivia Johnson. She's the program director. And the focus of the case study is her latest project, the Bridges program, which is a summer camp. It's a uh, six week summer camp program uh, established to, to build these connections between teachers and children. Um, uh, we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about the four objectives of that Bridges program on the next slide there, but it, uh, it teaches children in the neighborhood. It does provide um, teachers with some continuing ed credits, and it builds connections between uh, families and, and, the, and the school community. Um, so the objectives are to help teachers understand the cultural background of their students. There are, um, it's primarily African-American and Latino students. And it's, it's designed to help build pride in their cultures and respect for other cultures as well. Uh, helping teachers develop instructional strategies for a diverse group of students. I mentioned that they get continuing ed credits, so they get to kind of work on their craft over the summer. Um, help students build connections and trust with their teachers. So um, a lot of these kiddos are um, like newcomers to the area, so they get to kind of know their teachers or spend more time with their teachers over the summertime and build stronger connections between family schools and the surrounding communities. Um, so fostering that, that community building and being in the community and working with the schools even when uh, real school is not in session over the summer. So the, the current setup that they have in place, it operates Monday through Thursday. Um, the kids go to school on Monday through Thursday and they have uh, fun Fridays where they do activities outside in the neighborhoods. It is in the first year of operation it employs two uh, full-time MCC employees to, to oversee things. And then they have five teachers and five assistants. Um, the teachers are from neighborhood schools uh, with an average of eight years experience. Like I said, they're getting um, not paid, but they're getting continuing ed credits for their participation in the program. And in this first year, they had 45 students enrolled in the program. Um, like I said, primarily African-American and Latino students, and they were able to offer it for free so um, they were pleased with the, with the 45 students enrolled in the first, uh, the first year of rollout. Qualitatively, um, there's been a struggle to communicate and work together. There's been some, some issues with some language barriers uh, between uh, teachers and parents and students. The staff uh, really disagree on how to run the camp. It's, it's viewed as um, disorganized. Um, and not very, um, not very much planning taking place. Um, and then as I mentioned, the language barrier uh, is, a, is a big one as well. Um, and then the communication, there's, there's poor communication between uh, the, the summer camp staff, the MCC staff, and the, the uh, parents and families of, uh, of the kids that are attending. Okay, for our central issues, um, we're looking at first our secondary issues. Um, one of the issues is that it's newly an established organization. And so um, they're having, so with it being new, there is no functioning organization as far as the processes and procedures. Um, there was no clear organizational strategy for the Bridges Camp. 
um, like Jeff kind of referenced, like people are kind of all over the place. No one um, knows exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Um, there's an implied leadership, leadership structure. Um, Olivia didn't establish a successor or program leader for the MCC staff. Um, there's a lack of vision and accountability. Um, there's no um, defined mission of what exactly they're supposed to be doing. So like an organic mission statement, just fun awareness and experience. No clear channels of internal or external communication. So there's times when people are not sure of what they're supposed to be doing and they're kind of getting reprimanded for things that they're not aware of this part of their communication process. Um, unaddressed cultural barriers is that not all teachers, students, or families are fluent in English, and then sometimes the materials are sent out only in English and not bilingual. There's a difference in understanding um, of the time and the lack of relevant cross-cultural training. So we looked at the five whys of what was going on, and initially it starts off that the staff and families view the organization as being disorganized, which is leading to essential functions of the organization that are not being complete. Therefore, the staff is not able to work together or cohesively. Um, none of the staff had a job description, so they're not sure of what their role is um, or others within the organization. And then Olivia is not providing communication. So therefore, um, there's not a clearly established leader for the group. So for our central issue, um, we discuss that there's a need for leadership, like where is Olivia? Is this a competency issue or a commitment issue? So as consultants, we, connect, um, we conducted an interview and um, to gather some data. Um, as a group, we decided to interview Olivia, the current director of Multicultural Community Connections, known as MCC. We also interviewed the teachers and teachers assistants. We felt like um, that Olivia and the staff would give us all the data we need, um, the qualitative research. They, um, this were, was a small, uh, a sample size, a small sample size of the whole population, which included Olivia, the teachers, teachers, staff, and students and parents. So we just um, decided to interview the teachers and um, staff only. Um, we came up with these questions to ask because we knew that um, we would get the in more information than what we could see on the surface of the organization. You know, everything looks great, all her ideas are great, but it's not functioning well. So we knew that the teachers would share things and mention things and behaviors and concern we knew nothing about. Um, also, um, you know, doing our mock interview, um, we also wanted to aim for a collection of information, not one or two words answers. That's why we did um, open-ended questions. And for question one, um, we asked this question, um, tell me how your day is structured. And this was to the teachers, and what are your day-to-day -day responsibilities as teachers? Um, of course, we had that schedule, but we wanted to ask the questions to see if anything was mentioned outside of that um, schedule they had um, to offer. Um, we ask these questions because we're ex assessing both the quantitative and qualitative um, of their work. I mean, excuse me, the quantity and the quality of their work. Um, this will give us an insight into where and how their, the teachers are spending their times while checking to see how, um, to, how they prioritize the work. Question two, can you explain your job duties and expectations of the role? Um, we, want to, we wanted to know if the teachers know their job descriptions or anything that they um, should be doing in their role. We was looking to see if they were aware of exactly what to expect, what Olivia expectations was, and how to do you know, the job duties in the role. And, um, Please keep in mind that expectations and job descriptions are, are totally different. Some people mix those up sometimes. Um, question three, if you could improve one thing, what would it be? So this is very open because this is where people normally tell the truth. Um, you know, they dig down deep and you know, they remember things, um, start 
um, mentally remembering things that they like or they don't like or what they feel that they could be great because they're giving input here. This question will help us to know what the teachers value and find important to them while working for bridges. Um, and for um, question four, describe the training you receive, describe the training you receive for this position. Um, we want, here we want to know if um, the necessary training was provided to help make Bridges a success from the start because um, when you put um, resources into training, that means you want your um, staff to be trained well enough to, um, for the succession of Bridges, for the children to be successful, the parents to be um, excited to you know, bring their children and tell other people so they can continue to promote bridges going forward. <clears throat> so, you know, we was hoping to get some information for this question because if, you know, you put money in training, that means you want to get something out. Um, five, describe the support and communication you receive from leadership. We want to see if Lady, o Olivia is giving the staff the resources and support, you know, they need to be successful and communicating what's going on. Um, because when we read the um, the case study, it shows community, it's a lack of communication. But, you know, when you talk to people and ask, you know, questions one-on-one, -on -one, you know, they'll definitely talk to you and be a little bit open. And we interviewed Olivia, too, because, you know, we got to get her a chance. Um, her question, first question, what is keeping you from focusing on Bridges program? And is there something you want to be working on? This question, um, we asked this question because we want to know exactly, you know, what is her focus? Because, you know, basically we um, can tell it's, it's not Bridges uh, or she needs some help or something is not going right because of um, the complaints from the parents, the students, and the teachers. And, um, and you know, we asked, is something um, you want to be working on? Well, she's putting more focus into MCC. So we want to ask that to see if it's, you know, if that's what she's really going to tell us. Um, how would you describe the culture here at Bridges? Um, we want to see what her perspective of the culture is, asked in this question. What resources do you need to be successful? Um, and here we want to, as consultants, we want to know um, what's needed to help her to be successful with MCC and Bridges at the same time. And anything that we can, you know, help her or suggestions we can give to her. What are the goals of the programs and how to, will the pro, this program impact children in the community? So with this question, um, we're familiar with the MCC goals, but we want to, you know, and Bridges goals, but we want to hear from her mouth. What, you know, what are the goals and what she see the goals being? And how would you describe the working relationships between the teachers and teacher's assistants? Um, we asked this question to see if she's aware of what's going on with the teachers at this time because some of the teachers and the teacher's assistants are not getting along. Um, the older teachers that's been there, the permanent teachers and the temporary teachers, they're not getting along. Next slide. Um, doing this, um, building a rapport with the interviewee, we um, decided to pick a location that felt less formal um, with comfortable chairs and um, just somewhere where the um, interviewee could be comfortable, um, greeted them at the beginning of the interview, um, offered water, coffee, made them feel um, comfortable, open posture and body language. Um, we framed the interview and explained what the information we was hoping to get so they wouldn't feel uncomfortable. And, you know, we asked only open-ended questions. And as the note um, note taker, we want our note taker um, recorded the interviews versus writing them, just writing them, because we wanted to be able to go back and listen to see if we missed anything into in the interview, to um, and also to ensure that we had accurate uh, data, um, and um, this could help us with coding the responses later, because you know we can rewind it, go back, stop. And you know, take better notes um, because sometimes you know when you're writing notes, you can skip um, notes or um, the handwriting might not be too legible. And then um, when you're writing, it seems as though you're not really paying attention to the respondent. And um, we do ask if you know we do recommend if 
um, if we did take notes, it would be in shorthand um, when taking physical notes. And uh, we documented any body language during the interview too. And we will repeat the information that the respondent would give us to make sure that um, everything was clear and accurate that we received. Um, some of the questions we would change would be, tell me about how your day is structured. And um, we would just, um, we would just flat out ask them, what is keeping you from doing your, your best work? Um, just to just be, you know, blunt and open with what we're trying to get to. Um, another question that we would change are what are the goals of the programs for Olivia? Um, we would ask, so what is your long-term vision for the Bridges program since we really know, you know, what we are looking for? And one of the questions we would add would be, um, what do you need from leadership to do your best work? So in thinking about this case as a whole um, and really thinking through the lens of consultants, we also, um, aside from kind of practicing the interview and, and thinking about <clears throat> things to keep in mind as an interviewee, interviewer, and a note taker, we also wanted to think about, you know, after we've collected this information, what recommendations would we then be making to um, Bridges and the MCC team in terms of how they can fix this. So a couple of lessons just from the um, question taking and from the case itself. One of the things after we kind of worked through the questions and practiced some of those and, and did some of the mock interviewing was the way that you word the question really matters. So thinking back to some of the questions that we would change, the way that you word it is going to determine their response that you get. So asking, you know, how's your day structured versus what's keeping you from being successful is going to elicit two very different responses. So making sure that the way you ask questions is really specific and think through the lens of what answers you're trying to get at and frame questions that are gonna elicit that kind of a response to make sure that you're getting really intentional uh, responses and data from the individual interviews. And then we did feel like um, one of the things that stood out to us in this case was that it is really critical to establish rapport with an interviewee before the interview starts to make sure that they feel comfortable enough to be honest and provide you with the critical feedback that you're gonna need in that process. So that's why we had some of the notes about, you know, how to establish that rapport with them. And then in thinking about the case itself, um, one of the things that we feel like came up a lot in this case was, you know, people didn't really have a lot of training and development. And so people were all over the place. Some people felt like they knew what they were doing. Some people didn't. Some teachers were utilizing the teaching assistants. Some teachers weren't. Um, so it just really highlighted in our discussions, the importance of training and development um, when you're building a new team and how important that is to really having effective teams. People have to know what their job is, what their expectations are, and not just what their role is, but how their role fits in to the organization as a whole. So if you think of it kind of like a clockwork, you have to know what your function is, but you also have to know how what you're doing is gonna impact above, below, and beside you. Um, and that comes from really good training and development, which we think was a little bit of an issue in this case. <clears throat> a lesson from this case and thinking about the central issue with Olivia, um, is it a competence or uh, a confidence issue for her? Um, you have to be really intentional and, and careful in terms of who you promote. Um, one of the things that stood out in the case is that Bridges really was a passion uh, project for Olivia, but that doesn't necessarily mean that she should be the person leading that. So she may be a, a highly visionary person, but she may not be like an executing person. So she had this really great idea for a program and then they created it. And then she's been kind of MIA since it started and there's no real clear direction. There was no strategic planning. There were no specific job descriptions. We're not talking about how those teams need to be working together. Um, so as leaders, we need to be careful that we're not just saying, oh, that's a really great idea. And so we're gonna move that person up and we're gonna put you in charge of this whole thing. They can have a really great idea, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best person to be leading that project. So just being careful about why you're putting people um, in leadership capacities um, and, and how you're doing that. So in terms of our overall recommendations, um, one of the things that we need to figure out, and this would be part of the conversation with Olivia based on those conversations in that interview, is, you know, is she really committed to the Bridges program? And if she is, what's keeping her from 
actually making it function the way that it needs to. And if we, if she really wants to be leading bridges and we're pulling her between bridges and NCC, then that's something that we really need to adjust so that she can focus on the things that she needs to focus on. Um, but if she's really not committed to the bridges program and it was just kind of a great, wonderful idea that she had, but she may not want to be in charge of it. And that may be where some of these issues are coming from. So if it's a commitment issue and Bridges isn't what she wants to be doing, we need to find different leadership for this program. If it's a matter of um, competence and it's something that she really wants to be doing, but we haven't given her the skills that she needs, um, it doesn't, <clears throat> but one of the assumptions we could make is maybe this is her first leadership position and she hasn't really received any training or development and what that needs to look like or how she needs to be running things. Um, so it may be that she needs some additional training and development if she is going to stay on as the leader. Depending on what that conversation with Olivia is and, and what the kind of issue for her um, between competence and commitment, if it's an issue where she really isn't committed to the program, we would recommend either bringing in an outside leader that can run the camp kind of day to day that has experience running similar types of programs. And we would highly recommend that whoever is in for this program be bilingual given the number of families in the program whose first language is not English. Um, we're not currently able to provide resources, support, and communication that are functional for the participants of the program, which we felt like was a pretty key issue. The other option, um, if you didn't want to bring in an outside leader because the Bridges program is already running, um, you do have the option of promoting a current MCC or Bridges staff member that maybe has that competency um, or ability. And again, we would recommend that they would be bilingual. And then some additional recommendations for the, for the program itself. Um, they are currently, I think in the, the second week. Um, so a couple of things that we would wanna clarify before the, the program continues, I think it's like a six or an eight week program. We need to establish clear leadership. And then once that happens, we really need to communicate what that organizational structure is. Some of the other issues that came up in the case is, you know, if there's an issue, some people are going directly to Olivia, some people are going to other teachers, some people aren't doing anything. So we really need to communicate. If something's happening, here's the organizational structure. We need to clarify what people's job responsibilities are and what they need to be doing and how those things work together. We would recommend providing some cross-training on cultural dynamics because one of the issues that has come up with the teachers um, is around time and Western culture versus um, some of the culture of the students coming in that don't have a hard set time frame like we do in America. Um, so providing some cross-cultural training around that so that they can work better with the students and the parents. Making sure that materials are bilingual um, so that both the students and the families of those students in the program understand what's happening. They understand the permission forms for the fun days on Friday. Um, and they can really help support the students in that program because one of the issues was that the external participants and stakeholders didn't feel like there was enough communication or communication that they could understand. Um, and then really having a communication plan in general. So what types of things do we need to be communicating both to the funders of the program internally and then externally to <coughs> families. And then thinking again about some of the student expectations and did we set any of those expectations with students and families and if not, um, really clarifying what that looks like. Um, why they need to return permission slips and things like that for a fun day on Friday. Um, and then thinking about kind of next summer, um, there really should be a program evaluation or an after action review um, from each level of the organization after the bridges program completes this summer. Um, just to kind of figure out, since there have been so many issues, what's creating that and what can we be doing better for next summer so that we can make sure that we fix those issues before we get to next summer. Um, and then having kind of a clear marketing and communication plan um, to help recruit and sustain that. Um, because if one of our concerns was that if this summer was not a positive experience, those students might not return. Um, so now we're starting to impact the longevity of this program and if it's going to be sustainable next summer, because if the current students and families in this program aren't happy with it, they're not likely to send their student back next summer. So that's something that we need to be prepared for and, and developing a marketing plan so that we can make sure that we have the students for the program next summer. And then building in next summer some team building and cross-cultural training 
Um, and then formalizing our internal documents. So there's not really any internal documents that we can look at as consultants or as people who work for that organization. There are no job descriptions, organizational structures, training manuals or any of that. Um, so getting some of those formalized documents we think would be um, really helpful for them as well. Any questions? Anybody have anything they'd like to ask, to add? All right, I guess, I guess it's me then. All right, if you would um, go back to the slide with your interview questions. Um, all right, thank you. Now I could spend about 90 minutes on this case, um, but I will, <laughs> I will try to be brief. All right, let's think back to your 730 course on uh, organizational culture. Um, where we should always start um, anytime we're trying to do any kind of work or assessment in organizations and <clears throat> is with vision and mission. Do you remember those terms from, from your 730 course? All right, so vision, that's where we start. The vision is, is, is from, that's from the, the organization or the group themselves, what we intend to do. The mission is how we're gonna, how we're gonna do this. And that's kind of determined by, by the client system in terms of how we're going to do it. So I would start with that in terms of, if I was going to interview people, I would start with what's the vision of this program? And then, you know, what, what was the program intended to do? What was the big idea here? You know, what, what are we trying to move? What are we trying to do? Is this just simply a grant program so the teachers can get some renewal credits in the summer without having to pay to go to college? I mean, is, is that how this thing started? The mission, you know, what, what are we trying to do with, what are we trying to do once we have these young people with us? What are we trying to do with them? Vision, mission. We always start with those two. And that defines everything else. Now, you've got the right questions, and from here through, everything else, you know, is <clears throat> you've done it exactly as, as I would have done it or the, uh, the accepted way to do it. But you can never get away from vision and mission uh, because in, in the data world, all of our data flows from that. Um, obviously, a grant was written. What what is always when people give you money in a grant, you have to tell them up front what the vision and mission is and what you're going to do, your operational piece, and then what do they ask you to do at a certain point in that in that grant? You have to stop and do what? Assess it. Provide assess it. That is correct. And we assess it <clears throat> based on vision and mission. Did, did we do what we said we were going to do? So please remember, vision, mission, and in that order, we always start with that, especially when we're, when we're data collecting, because in the end, that's how we're going to assess it. We're going to assess what we did against the vision and mission. That, that's the way data collection, data gathering, data collection works. We collect the data, that is that that was portended by the vision and mission. Now, I'll give you a, a quick and dirty. I'll try to be brief. I hope somebody picked this case because I've actually done this exact case. Um, <clears throat> not this one, but one that mirrors this one. I was asked to do this as a consultant a long time ago in a land far, far away. I was a consultant. Um, I was a research associate at Chapel Hill um, when we were asked prior to improvement teams from the Department of Public Instruction uh, in the early years of accountability, we were asked as universities to go out and assess and, and, and work with districts on improvement. Um, that model later involved in DPI getting their own teams and then that's gone away again because of money, but suffice it to say, I've done this exact case. <clears throat> we, 
when I went out and met with the people who got the grant for the summer program, very exact same thing, summer program, teachers didn't get paid, got renewal credits. When I went out with them and, and started with vision and mission, what I discovered very quickly was <clears throat> um, they didn't want to be assessed based on what they had said they should be assessed on. Um, although when they wrote the grant, it was about improving the transition of these young people, these at-risk young people, same thing, language barrier, uh, economically disadvantaged, improving them going from middle school to high school to give them a better chance in high school. And they said, and I said, well, let's start with that. And so, you know, the vision was to improve their success in high school. Uh, the mission was we were going to improve three things, their attendance, their grades, and their behavior. Well, I said, that's very simple. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll start with those three things, and then we'll go collect data. We don't want to do that. Why, what do you mean you don't want to do that? Well, we, we're, we're not sure that we don't want to be held accountable for their success. I said, but that, that was the, the whole point of this grant was for them to be successful. That go back. That's the vision mission. We we don't want to do that. Um, and so, if if everybody doesn't know what the vision and mission is, and the, that's kind of the rules of the game, um, this is what happens. Um, it's just all over the board. Uh, and so, not only do you as a consultant need to start there, they had to to get the grant. They just chose not to follow through with that. Um, but that's where you start as a consultant so that everybody, so that everybody's playing the same game and, and you know what the rules are. You always start with vision and mission. All right. That's number one. Now, number two, if you'll advance the slides. All right. Go back one. All right. <clears throat> I've had to have this critical conversation more times than I would like to tell you when I supervise principals. <clears throat> what were you doing during your day that we weren't paying you for that prevented you from doing what we were paying you for? Um, I love this. I love this. This is, this is the critical conversation in in dysfunctional groups or organizations in terms of leadership dysfunction. What were you doing? People, people find things to do that make them comfortable. And there has to be <clears throat> what you want to do every day <clears throat> as a leader in an organization has to be <clears throat> what the organization needs for you to do every day. Um, if not, <clears throat> um, then there's a disconnect. We call that goal displacement. Uh, and, and the way that you do that, you're absolutely right. You ask that person, what are you doing every day? I'm here because, you know, we're not having our needs met as an organization. <clears throat> you're meeting your needs. What are, what are you doing? What, what are you doing that you want to do now? Uh, I could spend another 90 minutes on this one, but, but suffice it to say, people find ways to fill their time. The ways that they do that have to be aligned with what the organization needs for them to be doing. You have clearly found the central issue here. Uh, people are doing what they want or what, what fits their needs. That's not necessarily what the organization needs. That goes back to vision and mission. All right, if you'll go on. All this leads back, all roads lead back to vision and mission. Um, all right, so I love this, meet with Olivia and dress, you know. <clears throat> is it a commitment issue, need new leadership, if it's a confidence, confidence issue, training. All right, I wanna, I wanna focus on that piece for just a minute. I'm gonna oversimplify things for you this morning because I'm a simple person. There are two kinds of people in the world. They're natural tendencies. Remember, leadership's not a position, it, it's a skill or ability, and it can be learned. Um, that's, that's central to, 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 to what 
we're training you as an organizational leader. You have to understand that leadership is not a, it's not a title. Uh, it's not just a position with a name on a door or a business card. Leadership is a function. It's an activity. It can be learned. Now, Libya is not providing leadership. Um, and so you have to determine, is this a commitment issue or a competence issue? If it's a competence issue, then we can deal with it with some training. But here's, here's, the, here's the oversimplification part here. Two, people have two, one of two types of inclinations. You have curriculum people and you have operations people. In all organizations, schools, colleges, nonprofits, business, you have two types of people. You have the ideas people, and then you have the people who can, who, who can make the trains run on time, make those ideas, turn those into action. Let me say that again. You have the, you have the ideas people, and then you have the people who can turn ideas into action. <laughs> Unfortunately, if left to their own devices, people will simply gravitate to their, again, to their natural inclination. We have a lot of people who have wonderful ideas, but, but they, can't, they, they can't put them in practice. Then you have the people, the operations people who have zero creativity or very little, who never have a, who never have an, an original idea, um, but, they, but, but, they can, but they can make the, the organization function. The, the problem from you as, a, as an organizational leader, as a consultant, is taking those people and expanding their personal skills and abilities. That's, that's, what, that, that's kind of the essence of, of what you, you have to do if you're gonna do a training is, uh, I don't know that you can make people be more creative, but you can, you can offer them opportunities and, and experience and research and you, you can increase their capacity to think outside the normal uh, you can also help people who are not operations people with a strategic plan, how to, a strategic planning program, and y'all hit on that. That was perfect. Um, so if, if it's a commitment issue, you can't fix that. Um, that person has to be, you got to change that person out. But if it's simply a competence issue, you've got to figure out, in, in Olivia's case, she's an ideas person. She came up, she dreamed up this wonderful idea. She has no, she has no idea or no ability to then actually make it work. So you're gonna to need to do the strategic planning process, I mean, SWOT analysis, all the things that you've been learning, that's what you're gonna to have to do with, with Olivia. Now, if you're the organizational consultant to this, to this and, and you're answering to the, the higher authority, which is the people who, who are spending the money, um, they may not want to go through all that it's going to take to actually move this person to where they need to be. And so that, that's, that may mean, it, it, it may be both of those dashes may be new leadership. If it's a commitment issue, you know you've got to get a new leader. If it's a competence issue and you're going to, and here's, here's the training program, that you, you folks have, have laid out, and that they, they may opt for a new leader anyway, and, and you have to be prepared for that as a consultant. That, but you need to tell them the scope of what it's gonna take. You need to be honest. Here's the scope of what it's gonna take. So when we, <clears throat> when we look at interviewing this morning, um, all data collection goes back to vision and mission. Um, the people that are involved, you're exactly right. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing. They all have their own individual goals. Um, we've got to we've got to, to bring that together. The leader is not providing leadership. We've got to determine why and put a program in place for that. And so we've got two separate issues here. Um, and hopefully, and you had questions on each of those about you know. <clears throat> what everybody is supposed to be doing and, and, you, and you've got a plan to address both of those, both of those sides of things here uh, as well. And that's what you have to do. Uh, but be prepared um, that the organization is gonna have to make, um, or the funding source is gonna have to make a decision 
and that's outside of your scope, but you need to give them all the information and your data collection has to include that. Now, um, excellent presentation. I have one question for you here at the end. <clears throat> as a consultant, back to the example of where I came in as a consultant in, into a school district for a, for a program just like this that we're running. When you went to the vision and mission, um, prior to your interviews uh, and in your interviews, would you have any quantitative data that you could refer to? Would, would, that, be, would that be something that's uh, ethical or would, would you feel like that would be an ambush or um, tell me about the, the notion of prior to the interviews of reviewing the data, uh, the quantitative data in terms of student success. Would that be, would that be allowable in this case before the interview started? I mean, I feel like um, I don't, I don't remember there being a ton of quantitative information in the case itself, but I feel like if that information was available, I feel like it could be helpful to look at that as consultants because that may shape or change some of the questions that we're going to ask. So, you know, if, if the, the metrics that we have say, you know, yes, we're, we're hitting some of the goals, but everything's still kind of disorganized. Um, that would be helpful to know versus, you know, if we're, if we're not doing either one of those things well, that may change what some of those questions are. I feel like it could change what some of the questions are that we're asking. Well, I, I guess in, in, in essence, what I'm asking here is, would you share with them that things aren't going well? Here's what the data says. Here's what the quantitative data says. That students aren't being any more successful um, you know, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to bring this in as a gotcha where this place is, you know, you know, this is a fire drill. This is a disaster. It's disorganized and all that. Uh, one of the things that we have to make sure that we don't do when we're interviewing back to our original, when we're doing qualitative data is that we don't make the people defensive from the start. The whole notion, as you pointed out in your presentation, uh, is to open is to ask open-ended qualitative questions so that we can gather a richness of data. If we come in and, and thrash people, if we hit them over the head to start with, with the quantitative data, if we punch them in the gut um, and say, boy, this program is, you know, it, it's just awful. It's just disorganized and, 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 and uh, it's, it's ineffective. If we start with that quantitative data and we tell people that, Will they open up and talk to us? <laughs> no. Not work. <laughs> this is uh, Tim and Dr. Lamb. Um, I don't think, I think the quantitative information questions um, should be asked after the open-ended questions, after the interview is over, because um, if you provide the, I would say negative, the true numbers or the negative information, they're going to close up and there you go open and as honest as they would be because in the back of their head it's like hmm you know they probably feeling like reprimanded or in trouble they they, they feel very threatened that this is a punishment yeah. that's exactly right Keanu. you you've hit the nail on the head this is one of those rare cases where the qualitative comes first and then the quantitative although you as a consultant, what, what should have been the first thing you looked at? The yeah. quantitative data, because that's why you're there. Right. Things aren't going well. They don't call consultants when things are going well, although we should. When do we call consultants? When everything's are going bad. <laughs> when things are going bad. And so we need to look at the hard numbers up front, but it's really, it's not a best practice to start interviews or focus groups, the qualitative data collection by framing the quantitative problem because then everybody gets defensive and everybody clams up because they see that as this is a gotcha session. And so although you should have reviewed that data and you know, you know where, where all the zeros and ones are, as we say in the business, uh, 
quantitative people, we believe that all of life is just zeros and ones, binary. But if we start out with that, it's not going to go well. Um, I can tell you that right now, it is not going to go well. You will get very little qualitative data and what you get will simply be quantitative in nature, yes, no. It, 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 that, that's what it will be. And so you got to be careful uh, when, you're, when you're setting up. So as Kiana accurately pointed out, um, we're going to, we've got to start with them with the qualitative and then, then we can, we can look at the backside at the quantitative. We might we can share that with them. Um, but, but definitely we would not do that. This is not a gotcha. Um, we're not there now. My, my colleagues on the quantitative side would say that sounds, you know, that sounds reasonable, Bill, but <clears throat> how are you going to explain you being there? I mean, you, you know, you know, being ethical up front, what are you going to tell these people the reason why you're there and not mislead or be unethical or, or lie to them? Why are you going to tell them you're there? I mean, you just happen to be driving by the building and thought, of, you know, you'd come in and practice a little consultancy on them. Um, what, how are you going to set this interview up so that, it, that it's successful? We're going to start with vision and mission with these people so everybody knows that we're, you know, what, what, what songbook we're singing out of. Um, <clears throat> that we're right on, we're on, all on the same page. But we're not going to tell them how bad the numbers are um, because that would make them close up. But we want to be honest and ethical. We've got to give them some reason why we're there. What would you tell them? So, I'm not sure that there's actually a lot of quantitative data available. The, the program is a six week program and it's only been running for a week. Yeah, we were called in as, we were called in as consultants because of the disorganization. Right. Um, right. So I don't know that we'd be able to say like your students aren't learning or it's not the, the teaching's yeah, no. not effective or things like things like that. I think we, you're, because the teachers are getting continuing ed and things like things of that nature, we can frame it in terms of, we want this program to, like Monica said in the presentation, have some longevity and we want to kind of just evaluate it as right. it's being rolled yeah. out so that it can be something that, that thrives, something, right. something that's continuing and ongoing. Well, there's, there's data out there about how successful or not successful that these students are being or you wouldn't have gotten the grant to begin with. There's, there but was I, no grant. No. Well, I'm, I'm talking about in a grant situation. We're talking about if, if this was a grant situation, and usually, you know, 99 times out of 100, there's usually a grant situation involved with something, even if it's an internal grant uh, for, for special programs like this. Um, and so what I would say, and you're right, this has just got started. It's just, they had an idea, they started it, whether it's an internal or external grant, there was money that was put into this. Um, and so what I would say to what Jeff just put in, he's exactly right, what I would say is, we're starting this program up, we, we need to get some initial feedback on what's going on here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk about years previous, if there had been previous years, nor would I talk about how bad these students have been doing in school or or whatever, whatever caused us to get to, to start this program, obviously we weren't happy. That's, we weren't doing well with these students or these families and that's why we started this program. I would not bring that piece in. I would simply say, you know, we've got an internal grant or an external grant or we started this program and we want to start collecting data as we go um, I would not start out with this place, you know, it's disorganized. That's how I was talking about earlier. I would not start out with the negative piece, that, that things are bad. Why? This is not the inquisition. You, you frame this as we do data collection as we go. That's a part of any grant, whether internal or external, we want to, if it's internal, we might, even, we might not even call it a grant. We might just call it a program, but that's part of any of any process is, is we do data collection as we go. That's called formative data collection along the way. And that's how I would frame this rather than, whew, this is awful. 
you know, the leader's not showing up, it's disorganized, everybody's doing different things. It's all over. Don't start with that piece. It's, it's, not, it's not unethical to tell people the truth, which is we collect data as we go. Um, that may be the most important part of, of setting up your interview. Um, because otherwise people think this is an inquisition. You have to put people to your point. You have to put people at ease. And it's not just the physical environment, it's the psychological environment that goes on as well. That are we, are we being called into the principal's office because things are going bad? Um, you know, and if we, if we are, the first thing that we tend to do, all of us, is we clam up. And we give binary answers, yes, no. Or you know, nominal, yes, no answer is what we tend to do. And so when we do interviews, when we go out, if there's historical data or if it's a, a startup, there's always some quantitative data that, that kind of kicked this whole thing off. In this case, it was these students and parents weren't doing well. There, that part is always, that's understood. There's no need to beat people up with that. That's understood that there was a problem. That's why we're doing this. Um, but too many times people like me walk in, quantitative people and say, here's your numbers. What are we gonna do? And what do they, they do? And, I, I, and I, I'm talking about, what do you think the first thing when I was asked to, to evaluate the Summer C program, it was a three year part for the grant that had an external grant. What did I walk in and say, here are your numbers. Mm -hmm. And let's measure, you know, where we started. Here's where the kids were at the beginning. And now we'll measure them at the end. And what did, what did everybody say when I put them on to do that? Um, you know, I, you know, that, that was, that was throwing a bucket of cold water on, on it. Um, but that's what, that's what the, 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 the people who, who hired us wanted done. That was really bad. Uh, we, we got nowhere in terms of, of why, outcomes weren't any better. Uh, and nobody opened up, nobody said a thing, but that, that's, that's how I was sitting there as the consultant, the district came in with the numbers. Said, here are your numbers. You know, they're not, the kids aren't showing any improvement. You think anybody volunteered as to why things weren't, you know, why anything wasn't happening? When we were sitting in the room with the people who, who were running it? They dumped the numbers on them. That's why I said I was the consultant. And I said, well, we'll simply, you know, we'll do a, a pre and a post here. Uh, but the district came in and said, here are your numbers. They're not, you're not doing this program is, is not showing any change in student behavior, attendance or grades. Mm -hmm. And and the people who were running the program, you, you might as well just put a muzzle on them. Uh, and we were in a room to do, to do basically this case. And, 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 you know, nobody, had, nobody knew a thing. It's like they all got amnesia. Um, and so my point from this, from personal experience, and I've done other things, uh, if you walk in and, and beat them up with d bad data, you know, you know, I'm not talking about bad, but that data that does not reflect positively on them, uh, even if it's data from their students before the program started, if you walk in and you start out with negative data, you're done on the interview. You know, that, that's, that's Dale's rule on, on, on interviewing is, is, is that <clears throat> you tell people you're there for data collection, you make it, you put as positive a spin on it as you can without lying to people, but if you make the mistake, of hitting them with the quantitative first, back to what Kiana said. This is one of those cases where the qualitative has got to precede the quantitative. If you don't, there'll be no qualitative. You'll be done. <clears throat> All right, questions you have for me. Remember, vision and mission. Um, that, that's how we start our data gathering uh, is with vision and mission as, as the consultant. That, that's what we do. All right, very good. I love your, your plan, very thoughtful. Uh, you hit all the right notes, uh, very comprehensive. But as always, not a but, uh, as always, remember when we do these case studies, they're supposed to bring everything that you've had in seven, seven thirty two four six. Now we bring them, we bring all that knowledge to us 
now we're putting some we're putting some shape to it and we're, we're forming it now in 738. All those things that you learned along the way. Uh, we're, we're trying to put it all together and now make it make sense in 738. Excellent job. I saw evidence of each of the courses along the way. Strategic planning piece, um, those things were there. Excellent job. All right, who's gonna be next? We'll go next. All right, give me a name so I can, let me, so I can pick from my list here. Jules. Jules going to go next. Excellent. I'm going to make you the host. And I will stop my shoot video. You'll hit your share button. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. We are doing case study three, a case of Lyme, assessing the organizational culture at Resolute Winery. Some background information about Resolute Winery. It consists of a population of nine employees. Each employee has been assigned a specific task, which alludes to the winery's lack of family culture. Approximately 10 years ago, an HR consultant was hired to restructure the organization. <clears throat> and the restructuring really um, caused some uproar within the organization, simply because when you see an organization that has less than 10 employees, um, you know, what's the importance of actually having a structured organization? Employees have endured um, high turnover rates and the need for customer service training is evident, um, but it's not seen as an organization priority currently with the um, organizational leader, Mr. Main. The winery does yield about 50% of returning customers, while the remaining 50% visit Resolute because of the local billboard advertisements for free wine after purchasing their souvenir glass. An additional strength is that the historic winery has received two awards within the past year. But some of the opportunities for growth for this third generational business is number one, that they need a clear mission and vision. Secondly, that the data has been collected from customer satisfaction surveys, and on this 10-point scale, they do average an 8.9 average, but it seems not to be valid because leadership ignores feedback and does not have an objective point of view. The third opportunity for growth is selecting an employee of the month. Um, Mr. Main did state in the case that he um, awards or recognizes employees of the month but it is not it is definitely unreliable because leadership does, has not established clear expectations for measurable outcomes. It is also important to note that the local they have local competition right down the road. There is a, another winery, River Creek Winery, um, and so that part goes into the importance of the background with Resolute Winery. This table summarizes um, five different qualitative methods. Um, so our team really looked at and analyzed how we were going to interview and the importance of the method we used. Um, it's important that you understand, or we looked at the difference between um, ethnography, um, just having observations and interviews, and then the feminology feminological um, method, which looks at a sample size of about five to 25. And um, we definitely um, consider this as our number one method during our case study. Based on Resolute's opportunities for growth, our team has developed interview questions from these four key points culture, customer service, marketing, and then the outdated business plan um, because the winery is three generations in. Good morning. 
as the interviewer, um, we had an agenda that uh, we wanted to put in place and um, we list those uh, values there. We wanted to have the purpose and the personal introduction and the questions. Um, doing this exercise, um, we wanted to have that all result in some positive outcomes. The data um, was to be collected via the questions using a Likert scale. Um, we had the task and ob observation that we were going to um, look at their daily task and take those observations. <coughs> Excuse me. We uh, wanted to get some feedback from um, the interviewees and um, place some values on that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, also, the um, wanted to note any verbal and especially nonverbal responses, uh, get some customer analysis, um, how that would uh, uh, be uh, some intangible value that we could get there and come up with some recommendations. Excuse me. Um, I had some experience going into this um, because I had uh, lived by a uh, winery and um, knew the, the different areas of um, business that the wineries were targeting. There uh, are certain areas that are known for having different uh, types of business that are like the local bar, like the Cheers that you see. Um, maybe on TV, you go in there uh, to a winery, uh, you look at the, um, the grounds are beautiful, they keep their their grounds up, they have a quaint and a nice little rooms that you go in, you sample their wine, uh, becomes a real culture. So we wanted to see if, um, if that, uh, that kind of atmosphere was um, present in the winery and it had been established for a long time. So that uh, that was uh, something that we would be able to gauge and so it'd be a good background for the case knowing this information. On the next slide, um, we have where, Joel, the next slide would be <coughs> where um, we had, it went in with some questions that we had. Um, we would ask them some uh, specific questions while we were doing these interviews to give them, um, to gather our information and to, to uh, give the, um, our clients the uh, information that they were requiring on what could be done to be an improvement. I'm sorry, I'm having a dry throat issue. Um, these are some of the questions that we would ask and um, find out what the, what the culture and what the personnel of the organization, uh, what were the basic um, things that were happening there. So, so for the interviewer experience, the interviewer was straight to the point and up front in order to get responses to evaluate the culture of the organization. Um, it is important to appropriately interact with the interviewee and create a comfortable environment. So starting off by introducing yourself and sharing some background stories helps the interview become more of a conversation instead of a Q&A session. So as an interviewer, we should have had more quantitative data to com complement the qualitative data. Maybe we could have had more um, survey data to help shape the questions we had asked. So as the interviewee, um, for, we'll just kind of go back and kind of highlight the agenda. Um, so the, we wanted to be sure that we were clear on the purpose of the interview. The, our personal introduction, we wanted to have open-ended questions, um, we wanted to have follow-up questions, have an exercise, and have recommendations. And we felt like it was very important for our, the person that we were interviewing to feel comfortable within the interview. We didn't want to go into the interview saying, thank you for coming to the interview, or hey, this is an interview. We wanted them to, we wanted to be more like, um, let them know that you know, this is not an interview, we just want to talk to you like this is a conversation, just to kind of relax in the mood, kind of relax in that setting. So as the interview, we wanted, interviewee, we wanted to feel more relaxed. 
Um, this is a winery setting, uh, be more welcoming, friendly, and customer service uh, focused. Um, while asking these questions, some of the answers that we got were pretty interesting. Um, we thought it was interesting looking at um, asking questions about the mission statement. Mr. Main had pointed out uh, to a sign and said that was his mis mission statement. And that mission statement was, in wine there is truth, in good wine there is hard work, that family makes wine come to life. Um, while looking through and asking these questions, we found that that was his mission statement, but a lot of the employees didn't feel like family. Um, so that, that was very interesting. Um, we also found that some of the employees, um, they were hired to serve wine and pour wine, but they would have one lady um, work as the customer service person and she would offer the wine, but then she wasn't able to pour it. So she'd have to ask another employee to come over and actually pour the wine because they said she didn't know how to pour wine. She didn't know how much to pour and that was, that was a conflict. Um, we also found the family, uh, Mr. Main wanted this to be a very family oriented organization, whereas it really, it really wasn't. They didn't show up, all of the people didn't show up to Christmas events, different parties. Um, with our organizational chart, we had problems. Um, as the consultant, we went in and asked about higher positions because Mr. Main did mention that. And we asked about how the roles were assigned and, um, he just all he said was that um you know we didn't a lot of people didn't have organizational charts uh, but we have one and wanted to show that but then couldn't really explain anything with that um so we thought that was we found that to be very interesting um some of our some of our employees did say that um they you know they didn't wish they didn't have to worry about so much wine and they did want it to be a more more relaxed organization We also went over the fact that we had problems with our marketing. The marketing, we needed to get more together with the online uh, sales, advertising. 50% of our sales came from signage and 50% came by people that were just driving by. Um, we didn't offer any type of, you know, any deals. We didn't say buy two, get one free or anything like that. A lot of the people were just reoccurring customers. So we didn't, we, you know, we didn't really have a whole lot of more financial income coming in due to that. Okay. So the interviewee experience, uh, we found that the interviewee has to feel like part of the team to respond genuinely. If there's a lot of turnover, the interview responses will not be reliable and open to address the issue. Uh, the interviewee provided comprehensive responses that told a narrative story. Uh, the interviewee stated at one time, I didn't feel appreciated. Um, the, gener the general relational differences with leadership and new hires creates a gap in understanding how to effectively run a winery. So as the note taker, um, we found that um, you should record with another method instead of notes on paper. Uh, record to reflect how the interviewee sounded or responded to specific questions. Be more relaxed during the interview to collect genuine responses. Have follow-up questions prepared to collect data that gets to the central issue. And this helps with clarification. You should give ample time for the interviewee to ask questions. Uh, you get a more open response if the person feels relaxed and not rushed. Ensure no interruptions during the interview. Make sure cell phones are cut off. There's no distractions at work. Uh, consider pros and cons of group interviews to collect additional data. Some pros we found were to reduce time to hire, reduce costs per hire, and reduce interviewing biases. Some cons were it creates competition and lack of creative approach and less time to get to know individual candidates. Follow the agenda. Uh, be sure to pay close attention to detail. Observe verbal and nonverbal communication. You learn a lot by nonverbal communication. Uh, we found that out. Actively listen to take notes and collect any documentation for further review. 
uh, some things may be missed, so collecting documentation gives you a chance to learn things you may have missed. And for the experience, pay attention to how you can make the interviewer or interviewee not feel intimidated. Um, you get better results if uh, they're feeling relaxed and not feeling intimidated. Making sure that all information is recorded accurately and held confidential. Also understand the outcome of the interviews could sway note takers' perspective if not aware of biases and proper techniques for note taking. So in other words, you should stay neutral. Let me interject. If you'll go back to that slide and let me interject here. Um, on the process, observe verbal and nonverbal communication, that's called perception. Um, and that, that can be a part of the interview, uh, but you have to make that conscious. When you're doing interviewing, you, you can either focus just on the answers themselves and record it, as we talked about in the last one. Uh, in this case, this group is, is advocating for perception, which is you not only listen to what they say, actively listen, but you also watch for nonverbal non communication and clues, posture, body language, um, those kinds of things. That's, that, that would, that, again, that would be called perception in the business. And then on the bottom, um, this is what we were talking about before. Um, you, you have to, a priori up front, you have to set up in your interviews a way to not pe make people feel threatened or, or, or start out with, you know, we're not selling enough wine here. Uh, you, 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 can't, you can't hit them over the head with the quantitative and expect to get any real qualitative out of it. All right, thank you. Continue. Okay. And we also noticed um, things about the winery. Um, it was easy to find. Uh, the owner, Mr. Main, he was a kind hearted man. Uh, his previous attempts to correct the winery situation have failed, and Mr. Main was able to have frequent first-time customers. However, he did not have enough repeat customers. And this reminds me of my consultancy. I'm having, um, they're having the same issue. Um, they, they've got a lot of first-time, but not repeat customers. One of his issues was his employees' lack of tact in dealing with customers and the employees were confused on the proper amount of wine to serve. And this is the org chart um, that was in the case. Um, Mr. Michaels had inquired about how the roles and responsibilities were assigned. So Mr. Main explained that it adds some professionalism to the organization. But in essence, just looking at this, um, it looks like it shows very little teamwork. <laughs> Some of the questions we wish we um, um, we wish we would have asked uh, beyond the the culture, customer service, marketing, and um, outdated uh, business plans would be uh, what type of team building would you um, be comfortable doing? Um, I feel like well, we feel like that um, if you open this up for the interview, we to tell you exactly what they would be comfortable doing. It um, it can give you some insight to what's going on with them and, um, and, and the business. How do you feel about everyone's role and how do you feel about your role on the team? And then we wanna avoid questions that yield just a yes or no response. Um, we're not going to uh, get anywhere just listening to uh, you say yes or no, uh, with no kind of in-depth response. We, we need to dig deeper um, with those questions um, and those answers that we get. So you saw the, the organizational chart that they had, which was more of a tall structure. Um, we feel that um, Resolute Wine should be revised to go to a, a, a more flat structure um, where fewer levels of management and there's uh, more autonomy in the decision making. Uh, earlier in the case, you heard that um, um, yeah, you have certain people that have to, oh, this person has to come and pour the wine or they have to make the decision on this or there was, um, um, if they ran out of wine, they couldn't just go get some more wine. It was, 
uh, we have to talk to this manager to stock it up for us. So it's, it's really like they just didn't trust the employees with a more flat structure. Um, it will, uh, It'll, it'll, it'll put some of the decision making into um, the hands of the employees. Um, and it'll also emphasize more collaboration with the employees and, um, and, uh, and they'll be able to work together to accomplish their tasks. A lot of them said right now it's more like, uh, um, oh, it's not my job or there's just, there's just no um, assistance there at all. Now, with this structure, the supervisor will still have the final say-so um, in the company matters, but allowing the team to, um, allowing them to work as a team and bring that family culture that Mr. Main is really striving for, we feel like they should go to this um, flat structure. Now, lessons learned to conduct interviews successfully. So, um, you heard it earlier um, about this is a conversation between me and you and not an interview. We feel like you should provide uh, background information and create this setting uh, that is more comfortable to conduct a, um, a conversation. Um, I don't know why it is, but a lot of people do get uptight when they hear the word interview. Um, uh, just get a little bit more nervous and they might um, and they might not open up as much as just a, a conversation. Um, we, we also said that you should include various types of questions, um, uh, introductory questions, transition questions, key questions, and then ending questions um, leading into scenarios. So when we're saying these introductory questions, uh, you know, tell me about you. Tell me about your role here. How are things going? And then move into more of the um, the the questions that deal with the business and their role, and um, and um, and the culture um, of the business. And one of the the most important things that we felt uh, that you should do is the scenarios. Putting the putting the uh, employee or the interviewee in situations um, to see how they respond to those, um, those uh, scenarios or situations will let you know their mindset the, um, and how they think um, about, about, the, um, about the role that they have there and what they would do different than what has been previously done in the past. Questions. So, yeah, do we have any questions? Anybody have any questions you'd like to ask this morning? All right, me, me. All right, if you'll if if, uh, if you'll go back on your slides, thank you, Stephen. That was great. Uh, I want to highlight. Whoa, go back, go forward one. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Are we? Keep going forward. Okay, let's see what we got. Okay, so we're advocating here a conversation. Right. Um, be be reminded that if you if you do interviews in a conversational style, your your act your your answers may not fall into exact themes because if you're having a conversation you can't just sit and you know read the question off and then look down for the answer and read the next question a conversation the questions may differ between the interviewees or the the conversationalists you do understand that you won't have an exact common set of questions or follow-up questions if you if you're doing this conversation. Now, in an organization this size with nine people, is that a problem? Not really. What if there were 900 people in the organization and we were interviewing nine as a sample of the population? Would it be appropriate to have differing responses if we were trying to generalize from a sample to a population? That could be a problem. 
So again, that goes back to methodology, qualitative methodology. In qualitative methodology, Stefan is in this group is exactly right. I would do a conversation with nine people because that's that sample is the entire population, as, as Dr. Scarlett pointed out the last time we had it. So it is, it, even though it is a sample, but it's the whole population. And so having conversations is not a problem. But if we were, if we were selecting nine people at random out of 900, that might be a problem. And if we tried to generalize their thoughts to the larger group, this nine is the larger group. They are the population, so it's not a problem. That's excellent. That, that's that's excellent technique for a group of nine. That's the entire group. That's that. But it may not be. It would not be if we had nine hundred employees. Um, and I like the notion of introductory questions and those kinds of things. Now, if you go back to the very beginning of the presentation, and we'll start from there. All right, all right, advance your slides till I say stop now. Whoa, back up one. There we go. All right, so let's look at our methodology here. So <clears throat> we chose between ethnography and phenomenology. Um, Phenomenology and grounded theory are, are the two closest in terms of what the pairs are. Uh, phenomenology, they, they're pretty much the same, except, <clears throat> let me make sure I read this to you correctly here. One is the extension of the other. The difference is that phenomenology begins with a search question and grounded theory conduct, is conducted to, to discover the theory for testing. So what that means here is you pick correctly. You, you, you had a research question. What's your research question in, 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 this pro, in, in, this, in this case? What is the research question? You had it. And you're trying to you're you're working off of that that research question, which is, why don't we have more repeat customers? So so phenomenology was the the appropriate grounded theory. You, you just go out and you collect information and you and you build a research question or hypothesis out of that. We already had we already had a research question here. We we knew we had a problem, and so. That's why this would be phenomenology would be the appropriate thing to pick here versus grounded theory. Um, ethnography, um, I won't even get into that one, um, but ethnography would not would not be appropriate for, for this case. That's more about human behavior that falls in patterns. Um, that's way too deep for something as something as simple as pouring wine. <laughs> That that would not be that would not be a, a topic for an ethnography. Um, this would be a phenomenology, all right, versus grounded theory. It could be grounded theory if we didn't know, but we we understand what the problem here is, which is not enough repeat customers. All right, anybody else have anything? Excellent job. Now I want to I'm going to get out of this. Now I'm going to pause here for a minute. Uh, reclaim hers. I'm gonna pause for a minute and ask a, a theoretical question based off this case. Let me do a share. In quantitative, we talk about one of the one of the problems with a t-test and quantitative is we we do a pre we do a treatment we do a post we compare the pre-score to the post-test score that's a t-test what's what's one of the, the problems with that is is alternative explanations um, there could have been something else happened it could have been time maturity could have been some uh, event you know there's all we look for so that's why we do analysis of variance uh, which can tell us you know 
what part of the variance in, in the pre the post is, is on, on that dependent variable or that variable. <clears throat> Can there be alternative explanations in qualitative? Can there be qualitative alternative explanations? Can we discover alternative things? I would say yes. Um, thinking about the actual central issue, um, a leader might assume that the central issue could be, you know, budget. But then throughout the qualitative data, you actually realize that the central issue is something completely different. Well, but, but in this case, what did we, what did, what was assumed as the central issue here? As the reason why we didn't have repeat customers? What did, what did, what, what was assumed from the very beginning in this case? Customer service. Customer service, that's correct. Customer service. And as we observed in the phenomenology, as we observed, and then we set up our interviews, we observed that that was correct. Could there be also an alternative explanation as to why we don't get repeat business? Not just that service was poor, but what, what could also be an alternative explanation? People could not like your product. That they didn't like what we served. There you go that they didn't like what we served them. Oh, wait a minute now. Well, that throws a, a whole nother wrinkle in qualitative, doesn't it? We observed that service was poor, disorganized or whatever. And, and but, but where we make our biggest mistake in qualitative work is, is we stop. We always look for alternative explanations in quantitative, always. We talk about our limitations. You know, we, we do operational definitions. We look for alternative uh, explanations. We do additional tests. We run more sophisticated tests on quantitative data. We're always looking for alternative explanations. We're always looking for other things should we do the same thing in qualitative? Or do we always just work off of our initial assumption or research question? No. Expand on that, Michelle. Yeah, I think we should always we should um, just take your first you know, uh, assumption. You should always do more probing and research and uh, getting more That's, documentation. You know, see, what I would be doing is when I'm observing the service, I would be observing the customer's reaction to the actual wine itself, mm -hmm. what they're being served. Um, the biggest mistake that we make in most organizations is thinking that we're the best kept secret in the world. If just more people would come through the door or more people knew about us, that we would be a, a big hit, we'd be a success. Um, that it's all, it's only, our problem is marketing. If we could just, if we could just market better uh, and then we'll work on our customer service and everything will be fine. This is what we call in the business buggy whips. Um, we could make the best buggy whips in the world and have the best cu customer service in the world but what's the problem with buggy whips? Doesn't sustain. It, there's not much call in, in modern times for buggy whips. Few people still have a little horse and buggy, but it's just mostly a, a novelty item now. There was one time in our, in our country's history before the automobile that we had entire factories devoted to making buggy whips. We, we don't have that anymore because we don't there's not that big a demand for buggy whips 
we're 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 the best buggy we 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 are the best in the world at buggy whips, but there's no demand for buggy whips. Um, that's that's a that's one of those things that you know that marketing won't fix. Um, marketing won't fix if people don't like your wine. If they try it, half of them don't come back. Is it really the service that reason half of them don't come back, or is it that your your wine tastes like vinegar? You know. That, that's part of the data collection as well when you're doing a phenomenology, when you're collecting like this, you need to be paying attention to the phenomenon of serving wine to people and their reaction. That's the phenomenon in this case. That's the shared experience. They all get served and, and drink the wine. You can't just observe up through, oh, all right, we've got the wine in the customer's hand now. You've got to continue on with the phenomenon. They drink the wine. Do they, do they spit it out in the bucket or do they swallow it? You know, do they smile after they drink it or do they gag? That's part of the phenomenon as well, because that might be an alternative explanation as to why people don't come back and try that. Again. As to why they don't, they, that their repeat customers are not good. It might be that it's not the service at all, that people would be willing to, to put up with bad service if they're getting free wine if the wine was good but people won't keep coming back even for free wine if, if they don't like the wine so that's part of the phenomenology as well is, is we start out with a research question we're not getting repeat customers so yes that we did that the phenomenon is serving and then drinking the wine and the, the alternative explanation to just simply poor service is, you know, your wine's not that good. That, you know, there are, you know, in modern times, techniques have been developed, um, you know, better varietals, better mixes, you know, better flavor, less bitterness, less acidity, um, you know, that your, your old family wine making traditions, your equipment, your methods, your, your orchards, um, you know, grape orchards over time. Uh, you, you, know, you can have all kinds of agricultural issues. Uh, you know, may, maybe the product that you're making now, um, it looks like everybody else's, but when people taste it, it's, it's just not the same. It's, um, you know, we, we now have much more exotic blends and grapes and um, that, that tastes differently. Um, maybe your product is from a time past and it's just, you know, people who, who, in, who maybe are connoisseurs of wine of that, of, of that era. Maybe they're the only people who come back, people who are looking for a more modern uh, flavor palette that's not as bitter uh, and much smoother. Maybe that's, maybe that's the problem. They just don't like your wine. And so we have to make sure when we're doing qualitative work, especially a phenomenology, that we understand the entire phenomenon, not just the first half, getting the wine in their hands. We have to continue our observation on through the actual drinking and what that reaction is as well. So make sure you're exactly right. This is a phenomenology, but we can't just stop at, at halfway of the phenomenon we have to we have to stay with it all the way through now this is i love this case in that it's really visually easy to see that in other cases we do the same we make the same mistake we stop halfway but it's not as easy to see what the other half is we know from this what the other half is first half get the wine in your hand second half they drink it respond so Phenomenology follow it all the way through the phenomenon. All right, questions on that? All right, who's next? I think that's us, Dr. Lamb. All right, I'm sorry, I blocked my screen here. All right, who, who's us? Kitty. Kitty, that's what I thought. I had you queued up, I thought that was Kitty's voice. When I hit my participants button it blocks my screen I'll have to minimize that all right let me get out of that let me stop my video all right kitty you should be 
There we go. Excellent. So good morning, great discussion. So our consultancy team consists of Rod Brown, Keisha Bryant, um, Kitty and McCoy, and Raven Neal. Um, so we also chose case, I guess that was case four, um, as we were the consultancy team, utilizing exploratory qualitative data collection and small organization. Okay, so our consultancy team, our roles consisted um, of um, evaluator, um, program of program documents, um, an evaluator. We had an evaluator for um, direct observations as well. Um, but we also had our steps for process uh, for data gathering. Um, um, just as a consultancy team, we understood that um, qualitative research is an exploratory in nature and it's certainly used for uh, primary to obtain all possible reactions to communication uh, concept, concepts or um, situation. Um, our methodology in this case, we, we chose to um, collect three types of different types of data, which is in depth um, with open-ended interviews, um, direct observation, as well as um, evaluation of the written um, documents because we Excellent. wanted to gather and get an understanding of the issue at hand. So in our process of data gathering, we of course developed the interview questions, which I'll show in a second. Um, we interviewed key stakeholders, in this case, Olivia um, Johansson, the program director, um, student staff and parents as well. Um, there was some direct program observations <coughs> in, conducted and as well as evaluations of formal program. Um, documents that were um, made available to us. Um, so as a consultancy team, um, certainly the con you can see the interview questions here, but um, as a team, yeah. we, and based upon the inf information that we had initially from a conversation with um, Olivia, um, we knew that there was some inconsistencies that we were needing to address in this particular program. And so, and in each of the conversations that we had with those stakeholders, we certainly stated the purpose for our, of the interview, um, and uh, as well as with the questions of development, we certainly wanted to address the inconsistencies. Um, there are one we wanted to know how familiar they were with the mission um, of Multicultural Communication Connections (MCC). We wanted to see how well they thought the Bridge Program was going. Um, um, we wanted to know ways uh, from them, ways that um, the bridge program aligned um, better with the MCC mission um, or could align with the MCC mission. Um, we wanted to also find out um, what they thought will occur once there is a true connection of mission um, of MCC as well as the purpose of bridges. Um, wanted to gain their, um, their thoughts and perspectives of the benefits of the program, um, as well as um, to see how they felt from their view, how they felt they were meeting the needs of the children that were being served in, bro in both programs. Because we know, um, as you will see, we'll go through some of the information that we found out. There was um, um, staff from MCC, as well as teachers um, and assistants on the bridge side. And lastly, we wanted to um, act, we asked them to share anything in addition. They felt like they needed to um, to do their best um, in order to serve the the students or the children in the Lakeland community. So we were able to gather some background information based upon those um, interview sessions as well as previous conversations. So. We want to know, as a consultancy team, we first needed to know who is MCC, um, the Multicultural Community Connection. And so, as you know, if you've heard earlier, it is a nonprofit in a large metropolitan area in the southeastern region. Um, the goal is that they aspire to foster community building amongst diverse populations in this specific um, community of Lakeland. The program director is Olivia Johansson. Uh, and this is a new initiative that she is birthing, that she's excited about. 
um, as a component of MCC called the Bridges Summer Camp. The goal is for it to be a six week summer camp um, and it is to establish cultural bridges amongst the teachers and the children of the community. Um, there are four objectives to this um, summer camp and we found some very tangible benefits to Bridges and so the objectives that we um, for Bridges the summer camp were one to help the teachers understand the cultural background of the students that they are serving um, is to help them to envelop or develop instructional strategies to be able to teach a diverse group of students because um, in this we know that there some of the students are immigrants um, it's to help the students also to build connections and trust with their teachers um, so that there it can be like a holistic community. And lastly, to build strong connections between the family schools and the surrounding communities. The benefits, if this is done correctly, is that students will have a fun and safe environment that they can have when they're out of school. Um, it promotes awareness um, with the instructional staff um, while helping them with their continual ed um, credits and advancements that they need to um, satisfy. And lastly, it provides some hands-on opportunity for college students as they work with the students and the teachers in this program. And so the program overview, some of the highlights is that it is in its first year of implementation. So that was something for us to make sure we kept in mind as a consultant team. Uh, we have 45 students currently enrolled in the program two full-time MCC employees. There are five teachers and five assistants. Um, the great thing is that the teachers work at neighborhood schools, so they kind of already have an idea of the community. And um, we have teachers who are coming with experience, um, eight years of experience. And it's primarily African-American and Latino students that we are serving. So with that data though, we need to take a closer look at the numbers. And so um, this is where the data analysis comes in to see what the um, rumblings within the program are. So I had the opportunity to spend two days um, observing the day-to-day -day operations of the Bridges program. In my time observing the program, I was able to get a sense of a warm and inviting atmosphere. The teachers and assistants um, greeted the parents and the students as they come in. They gave hugs and smiles. Throughout the day, you can see that it was pretty interactive, um, a lot of fun, and trying to uplift the children's spirits about being in the summer program. Another observation that I found was that the schedule, which we were provided, was being very loosely followed. Um, time frames. Um, one example that I saw on both days was breakfast would go run over, which would then cause the first instruction of the day to start late and then trying to kind of catch up to make sure the students are getting everything that they need in the day. Um, observe that the teachers and the assistants did not to uh, were not in unison. So you saw some separation of the two. Um, a lot of the instruction from the teachers were um, brought in, I guess, from their traditional um, style of teaching from the mainstream um, or neighborhood schools. And then you had some of the assistants who were more embedded in the classroom side by side with the students, really not connecting with that. And there was some side conversations happening between the assistants and the students. Um, again, the instruction was primarily being delivered in English, which there were several students who were Spanish speaking. And I observed that there were times where uh, students that were bilingual trying to assist the Spanish speaking students um, translating in class, which ideally those students are there to learn as well and should not have been burdened with um, providing that type of support to their peer. Uh, you also had the assistants who were there to do some of the translating as well. Um, another observation was uh, communication between the parents and the staff. So there were parents who had questions just about some of the procedures. Um, one important thing that came up was the uh, permission slips for the fun Fridays and some parents not understanding why they had to sign a slip every week. Um, some of them not being able to complete it because they were written in English only. So not being able to understand what they were signing. Um, 
observe some parents feeling ignored. Um, there were some situations where they approached a staff member to ask for clarity and they were not given any clarity. And so it, it didn't occur in a rude way. It was more of a bypass and change the subject. And that could be because again, without clear um, process and procedures, the staff didn't know how to answer those questions. And lastly, again, an overall just um, appearance of inconsistent procedures in place for the Bridges Summer Program. So overall, um, here are the uh, main points of our analysis from the data that we've collected. Um, the Bridges employees struggle with communication and working together. Um, that was apparent throughout all the analysis um, and research that we did while we spent our time with MCC. There were ongoing language barriers between the staff, uh, the MCC staff, the teachers and the parents and students. Again, a lot of side conversation, you know, some of that we understood because they were trying to um, translate to the Spanish speaking students, but again, communication between the teachers and the assistants. Um, there were times where you had the assistants in one area with the students, but then the teachers were not visible, visible. So I was unsure what they were doing while the assistants were with the students. Um, lack of cohesion in regards to the operation of the program. And so again, it was evident that each um, staff, so the teachers, the assistants, um, they wanted what was best for the students. You could tell that they enjoyed being there. They wanted to teach and help the students learn and grow and to adjust to the new culture that they've been embedded in. But it, it wasn't being done in a sense of togetherness. Um, Lack of uh, deficiencies in channels of communication between the parents and the staff. Again, there was no clear sense of if parents had an issue or they wanted to discuss something, who they would go to, who could answer the, their questions and how they could go about doing that. Um, on, a, on a high note, um, parents seem to be very appreciative of of the summer program, of the Bridges program, and having their children have somewhere safe to go in the summer while they worked. Um, they appreciated the warmness that they felt when entering the building from the staff. And then the staff do feel that their work with the students um, is meaningful and that they are making a difference. Continuation with our analysis, um, MCC staff did not receive training on developing or leading the Bridges Camp. So as we know, this was an idea of Olivia and it just it seems that they just started it without a lot of sitting around the table to talk about <laughs> how we need to implement this new program. Um, with that, the staff was unable to provide leadership over the Bridges program. They were not able to implement the vision and the mission throughout the program. So, you know, taking the MCC vision and mission and stretching that through the, the Bridges program and how would that look? Um, and they were not able to maintain daily operations effectively. Again, with time, schedule, transitioning from um, more lax areas like um, meal times and, and recreation into the learning um, with the teachers. Uh, the teachers and assistants did not receive adequate training on implementing the curriculum with Spanish speaking students. And again, I was able to observe this in the classroom. Pretty much you had the teacher at the front of the class giving a lecture and not really acknowledging that you had students that were not able to learn in that capacity. Um, they may not fully understand um, and be able, not being able, I'm sorry, the teachers and assistants did not receive adequate training on implementing the curriculum of Spanish speaking students, which I just talked about. And they may not fully understand and be able to adapt to cultural differences. And again, that was seen more with the teachers than the assistants. Some of the assistants, you could tell, had a little more experience with the culture. Um, and then struggling to connect work with the organizational mission. Again, that mission and vision not trickling down to the Bridges program 
Um, lastly, students did not receive classroom program expectations. So again, as mentioned earlier, the, the students didn't really know what to expect coming into the program. And so the structure that maybe the teachers felt should be in place were not, and the students were not expecting that. So there was a little bit of tension there. Um, and then the students struggling to assimilate and adjust to American education decorum again, really not a strong expectation or clarification on what they should be learning, how they would be learning so that both the student and the parents understand what to expect. A good deal. And that brings us to our uh, SWOT analysis. Um, so we want to jump straight to the opportunities where I want to focus your attention. And the first thing that we conclude is that there's a tremendous uh, amount of opportunity for uh, the team to become more culturally endowed. And what we, uh, what we mean by that is they need to take a proactive approach to uh, better understand cultural backgrounds of uh, internal stakeholders. So this includes parents and students. Uh, secondly, uh, to build a stronger rapport uh, with these stakeholders, and this can be accomplished uh, through, um, you know, discovering common connections such as shared experiences. We know that uh, Olivia uh, was once in the in, in the same position uh, that the the target population that she's trying to uh, trying to serve. So, um, making a deeper connection at that level will certainly help um, uh, generate a better, uh, a stronger rapport across the across the uh, organization. Um, this also makes uh, building the rapport um, uh, relationships and communicating uh, much easier. Uh, and the next thing that we've identified as an opportunity is uh, to develop instructional strategies uh, that would truly engage uh, the program participants. Um, and one way with that this, this could be done is again, to be proactive, uh, strategic and developing um, or discovering best practices that will promote optimal quality and effectiveness. Um, and so we've identified a few ways that, that this could, could happen. So some best practices we feel uh, as a consultancy team in this scenario would be uh, through visual, uh, visualization. Uh, this would bring uh, relevant concepts to life um, and that the students and the program participants will um, resonate with and uh, practice learning experiences with um, will help all students make connections uh, between the content and the real world. So given the situation that they're in, since they're newcomers um, and, and they're uh, adapting to a, a, a culture uh, nationwide that's different from the native language. Another uh, instructional strategy is uh, through cooperative learning. Um, I feel like utilizing small groups uh, would empower students. And we see a little bit of, uh, of that with students uh, you know, that were a little more fluent in English, uh, trying to translate, but it would help uh, with empowerment of students uh, with mixed abilities to work together. Um, and certainly uh, incorporating technology is a 21st century best practice is a great way to uh, actively engage uh, students. Uh, so those are the opportunities. And then we'll, about, we'll, we'll toggle back here to the strengths. Uh, one strength is that, that, that I mentioned, Olivia has demonstrated uh, success uh, in regards to program innovation. Uh, so, uh, one, one thing I want to point out is that um, while we talked about uh, the issue of commitment uh, and competency, we, we certainly know it's not a competency issue with Olivia and, and her uh, leadership. Um, and so the idea of bur uh, burnout came about instead of um, a commitment issue. It could be that Olivia um, uh, is burning out. She's uh, pioneered uh, similar programs before and she's developed a successful reputation. So that's one thing to kind of keep in mind. Uh, as we uh, we see that as a, uh, as a as a threat also, but uh, it is a strength uh, that she is uh, committed uh, to the to the cause. Another uh, thing is Olivia's fluent uh, in both English and Spanish. Uh, this is something that uh, we need to capitalize on. Uh, somehow um, train up uh, subordinate staff or, or, or coworkers um, and put put programs or, or procedures in place that will be able to. Uh, to minimize uh, that communication barrier. And another strength is that staff uh, participates in a, um, or at least they participated at the, at the onset of the program in a week long orientation and training. That's a strength, but uh, uh, we'll see uh, in the subsequent slides, uh, you know, the idea of uh, there, there's a clear lack of uh, strategic planning uh, uh, going forward. Uh, the weaknesses 
uh, that we've uh, and potential risk is a personnel uh, displacement um, that, that was mentioned before. Uh, we may have we may have the right people on the bus, but they may not necessarily be in the right seat. So we want to make sure that we align strengths with uh, roles and expectations. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, there's a lack of uh, continuous training. So there was that week uh, weekly training uh, up front uh, at the start of the program, but uh, you have to kind of get a pulse throughout the program to make sure that you hit the target and that uh, what our efforts are, are uh, in alignment with uh, the mission and vision. Uh, and the other, uh, another threat that we, or weakness, I'm sorry, that we've identified is that the, uh, it was ambiguous uh, duties and expectations. Uh, we understand that uh, there's a couple staff members from MCC, uh, but we're not necessarily sure what their roles and expectations are for them. So, uh, and again, uh, the ultimate uh, elephant in the room is the, is the, uh, the lack of clear leadership. Uh, this is something that needs to be addressed um, uh, pretty, pretty uh, immediate. And then a threat, we'll bounce back to the, uh, the threat towards at the end, inexperienced staff uh, running the program. I mean, we got a, a group of people, like I said, who may be committed, but not necessarily in, uh, performing the right duties. Uh, so it uh, may not be practical uh, for these uh, individuals to be overseeing a program. Uh, because there's a lot at stake. Uh, there's a lot at stake. Uh, and so the, the lack of organizational One of the things that came up was the language barrier, the communication issue, um, which is translation problem. We, we observed that there was a translation problem between uh, the Latino and American staff and students, uh, which this shouldn't be an issue uh, because Olivia's native language is Spanish. So there again, um, it looks like um, the major threat that, um, or weakness is a lack of a strategic planning. So we'll move forward to the next uh, slide, which identifies our uh, central issue. So here we've uh, kind of got it um, mapped out. Uh, at the very top, uh, we, we you know we concluded that there's a lack of effective leadership, uh, and down below, as we can kind of see the tentacles uh, kind of stretch out. There's no strategic plan, as I'm, I'm referencing to, to my left. Uh, there's no strategic plan uh, to be implemented. Uh, everybody's kind of stabbing in the dark. And as a result of that, the, the, you have poor communication uh, that's kind of underneath the surface of that. Uh, no clear channels of uh, communication with uh, external uh, stakeholders uh, and uh, parents, and also the, uh, the, the funding sources. Um, and obviously there's a language barrier. Uh, to the right of this uh, illustration here, we see the lack of organizational structure. Um, and then we mentioned that it's undefined roles uh, the responsibilities for the MCC staff that's been uh, designated to uh, be hands-on with this uh, Bridges program, but that's not necessarily happened. Uh, inexperienced staff uh, overseeing the program that we mentioned uh, on the previous slide. And of course, staff members uh, aren't uh, working together. So there's, uh, so there's tension, uh, no cohesion. Uh, so there's, uh, without, without that, uh, those, those uh, critical pieces to the puzzle, uh, you can't be successful. And so on the next slide, we, um, we kind of highlighted just three of some second, three secondary issues. Uh, the first being uh, there's a, uh, a degree of incompetence in terms of cultural differences. The main thing is, uh, you know, time orientation, um, understanding the difference between uh, how different cultures view time. Uh, whenever we start uh, reaching uh, beyond boundaries and, and, and and going across borders, we got to understand the differences, how people understand uh, time. So here uh, it was identified as uh, monochromic versus polychromatic timing. That's something that's important to understand. It's a significant orientation uh, when working with uh, uh, intercultural organizations. Secondly, uh, we mentioned unaddressed barriers. Uh, this is the translation problem that I identified. And then third, uh, unestablished culture. Uh, we really feel that, uh, because, and this is due to uh, the, the lack of strategic planning up front. Uh, maybe, it may be, it's always, you know, in my experience, laborious up front, uh, but you have to put in the legwork up front, uh, and then um, things will simmer down. But uh, without the uh, uh, unestablished culture, um, you have low morale, staff not functioning cohesively, uh, in large part due to uh, the day-to-day -day plans is, is absent. So that brings us to our next uh, slide, which is our recommendations. So we'll be considering all the 
information that we were able to gather, um, we found that there were several points of an immediate um, need uh, for the Summers Bridge. And uh, we do understand that it is a six week program and um, we already started the program. So there's some quick things we felt like um, we needed to do once we shared this with um, Olivia was to one, establish some clear leadership or leader or leadership for the facilitation of effective um, communication programming and organizational structure. By doing so, we could clarify the job responsibilities for all the staff, retrain, so maybe a day training on, uh, for the sake of this, uh, for the continuation for this program to continue this summer, um, to retrain on cross-cultural dynamics, um, to ensure that all materials are bilingual, Olivia can speak, she's fluent in both. I think those are quick things we can um, do develop internal and external communication plan. What will we do remaining for the remaining of the program? How will we communicate to parents? Um, and I think the important thing, because we, you know, all these, we're talking about leadership, but it is about student. And there were three benefits that we talked about for this program and staff felt like their work is meaningful and the students actually, you know, enjoyed the experience. So we, we don't want to miss out on the point of resetting this for their experience. And um, setting some expectations for them and what would it look like moving forward um, and as the program ends for this particular summer by next for next summer um, we want to make sure there is a program evaluation and assessment for each level of course leadership um, teaching training all of those things um, the culture um, setting the culture initially um, establish an implementation plan what is the process what are we going to do first um, incorporate team building and cross-cultural understanding into this particular training. And I think we felt like it is important um, that we formalize uh, internal documentation, so rules and procedures, so establish a handbook of sorts, um, so we'll know how things operate, you know, and even if it's not Olivia as being the lead, um, she, others will know what to do, what the expectations are. So we do understand that this is the first year of implementation, but we wanted to make sure we can address certain things for um, the expectation of the, um, this particular Summer Bridge um, program. And then we're preparing for the next. Are there any questions? All right, let's stay right there. Okay. All right. <clears throat> We start with the vision, and then the mission is the kind of the day-to-day, -day, the operational piece, what we're gonna do. Assessment drives instruction. We have to assess what the adults are doing. We call that fidelity checks. Summative, eva formative evaluation. Formative evaluation is, is of the adults and the delivery. So, the critical piece in, in a fidelity check, that's the leader going out and making sure that the program is being delivered as intended. That's what a fidelity check is. The problem arises when <clears throat> we haven't fully developed our mission from our vision in terms of we don't have any clear deliverables. How do we assess people whether they're delivering the program as intended when we haven't even developed that piece. The, the central problem here, you, you've hit the nail on the head, I love this. Program evaluation assessment from each level. You're gonna have to know what the program is in order to assess whether it's being delivered or not. That What that program is, is developed out of your mission. Without a clear vision and mission, we, we don't know whether people, all we know is it's not happening. We don't know why. We can't assess where people, uh, if, if our, our employees are delivering or not because they don't know what to deliver. Uh, so what we have to make sure of when we're, when we're doing an assessment like this, when we're coming in as consultants is, do people, obviously Olivia, we talked about the need for effective leadership. What we need for Olivia to do is be in the rooms or be there to know what's going on to see is, is this what you intended for these people to do? Did they know what the, the intention was? Did they know what the job was? Did they understand 
what the expectations of them to do every day. Um, you know, the biggest, the biggest organizational conflict you can have is what the organization needs or wants for you to do every day is not communicated for you. So in the end, you're not, what you do every day goes back to what were you doing that we weren't paying you for that kept you from doing what we are paying you for? Do, we, do you know what we expect you to do every day? And then the leader has to assess or do a fidelity check to make sure that it's being delivered as planned and designed. Goes back, start with vision, mission, and translate that into operational, and then we can assess whether that operation is happening or not. But if we don't start and, and go down the line, we don't know why, what we're doing. The employees don't know what they're doing. The leader doesn't know if they're doing what they're supposed to be or not because we have no clear plan or no, no expectation. That goes back to strategic planning. I believe you had that in 732. So again, we go back to our previous learning. Um, we don't really have a strategic, we haven't operationalized our vision and mission. We haven't operationalized them into a strategic plan. So we can't assess whether whether they're delivering or not. We can't do fidelity checks because we don't have we don't have a strategic plan. We've not operationalized it. What you know, our 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 vision and mission have not been operationalized. And so th this is how you go about doing that. This is excellent. If you'd go back to your original slide, I want to, I, I'm keeping an eye on our time here. Um, all right, that was it, go back. All right, let's see. Go back one slide. Whoa, let's see. Uh, go forward slowly, let me, whoa, that's it. That's what I want right there. All right. Let's go back to our very first case study. Again, we always want to build on prior knowledge and what we've done. Then. Do you remember our first case study 16? Um, the CAN, uh, our, our area network. Do you remember that one? Do you remember that case study that we did, our very first one? The Community Action Network CAN. And we talked about in that case study that we always, we have to find ways to evaluate our programs, whether it's an external grant or an internal grant, we, it's still a nonprofit. Somebody else, either we're raising the money and we have to answer to our budget to the board of directors or an external source has given us money and we have to answer to them. But, but either way, we have, to, we have to be able to show that we're being good stewards of that money and resources in nonprofits. Let me say that again. That's, that was the takeaway from our first case study is we have to be able to show people the qualitative and quantitative methodology. And, and we have to agree what, what the metrics are you remember that that case study we have to agree with our with, with our board or our funders whether it's an internal or external grants in material it's a grant um, when we start a program we're using that's what we call it in nonprofits it's a grant internal external doesn't matter we have to be able to answer to the the funding source and show effectiveness and show that they're getting what they paid for, bang for the buck. That's what frames all of these. And we're, we're, we're talking about working in nonprofits versus the profit sector. They have to answer to shareholders sometimes, but that's a completely different metric. What we have to do is show that we're being effective either through the number that we serve or how well we serve them. But also involved in this is we have to at some point show some outcomes whether whether and, and that needs to be part of our vision mission our operation oper operation operationalization of of that vision and mission is is in the end whether it's through how happy parents are 
or our well kids, you know, our kids are doing better in school. And, 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 and at the end, we have to be able to show some results. Even in, even in nonprofits, we have to be able to show results. And so we can't discount that along the way when we're doing data collection, even in qualitative, um, maybe, maybe the results that we would show in this one would be how happy folks are. Um, so, so that's always, we've always got to keep in the back of our mind, our overarching theory in all nonprofits that are dealing with grant programs, internal or external, is, is that we have to be able to show effectiveness, that we're spending, we're being good stewards of the money, and resources of the of, of the nonprofit itself, if it's internal, external, the people who are giving us the money. We always have to be able to show results. And we do that through data collection and data analysis. Quantitative numbers, qualitative. That's the overarching theory that we, we need to come away from today. And then I want to, to kind of summarize at the end, let me, let me go. Uh, a case of wine. The the overarching from that one is that we can't just always assume that it's a marketing or service problem. Yes, those those are problems. We have to get those squared away, but we also have to be honest with the people who hired us. In, in cases like that one is that we might market, we might be able to market you and we might be able to, to uh, help you to provide better customer service. But there's also the alternative explanation that people might just not want your product or your service, you know, they might not want your product. Um, and you can't, you know, uh, unless you're willing to change it, it may not change your outcomes. That's specific to the, 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 the example that I want to bring to mind, and boy, this is a stretch, but the case of wine is part of the problem with churches. Traditional orthodoxy in terms of Baptist, Methodist, those kinds of, of churches is, is that many of them are seeing a decline in membership. We do a good bit of work. Uh, Dr. Hamilton more than I, he's kind of the point man, I do the data analysis. We do a lot of work with churches uh, at Gardner Webb because of declining and their, their problem is all the same in terms of the, 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 the outward problem is declining membership. Their membership is dying, literally dying with old people. And one of the things that we have to share with them is we could restructure a lot of things, you know, the salary structure of the and compensation package of the pastor, you know, all of the operations of the church to make them more efficient and cost effective. We can do all those things. But in the end, one of the things that we have to share with them is, is that the actual product that you're providing um, is not as popular as it one time was. Um, not as many people are going to church, not as people, many people are getting involved in organized religion. And the younger people are looking for a different product, a different message. They're, they're more in tune with the prosperity gospel of many of the big mega churches, which is a completely different message. <clears throat> as we're in, as this past Tuesday was Fat, Fat Tuesday and the past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, um, we're reminded that in traditional churches in Christianity, that Ash Wednesday is about mortality and death. Uh, it's about sacrifice. It's 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 about Lent is giving up something, you know, uh, voluntarily uh, giving up something, basically uh, punishing yourself for forty days. Um, that's that's a traditional component. Easter uh, is a traditional component of of traditional churches. Uh, that message of sacrifice and mortality and death um, does not play well with the younger audience. Um, the prosperity gospel, that's, that's not, not as much in that. And so they're attracting the younger customers. Um, and so what we have to explain to some people is we can market you. 
we we can work on customer service. We can we can work on making you more efficient as an organization. Um, those kind, of, but but just in the end, you need to understand there's less consumers of your product, and unless you want to change your product, um, uh, th this decline is inevitable. If, if if you unless you want to change your product, the wine man, you know, it may be that. Uh, his wine is just not, it, it's, it doesn't fit the modern taste profile. Maybe that's it, uh, or all terms with explanation. In colleges, we know that there's a declining number of students graduating from high school. So we have a declining, you know, a declining base. We might can market a college, we might can, you know, we might can work on uh, the core itself and the, the experience, the dining, all those kinds of things. But it may be that the majors that we offer, the actual products, uh, might be that people don't want them as much anymore. That's the, the crisis we face in undergraduate liberal arts education colleges. Not as many people are in the market for that product. Um, and we could be the best at delivering it. We could have the best marketing strategies, but we have to understand that the customer base is shrinking more and more every year in terms of folks want things in STEM, engineering, uh, they, want, they want things that are more modern in terms of the job possibilities and the careers that are available. There's not as many careers for folks in liberal arts. That's just the nature of how the world has changed. Um, and so we have to understand, and so, Gardner Webb, I'll use Gardner Webb as an example. Over the last 10 years, um, after the enrollment did not rebound after the economic crash of 2007 8, Gardner Webb started hiring consultants to come in and work. They redid the logo, um, they redid marketing efforts, they redid admissions process to make it more seamless and easier. They got involved in the consortium for online uh, applications and more than doubled the number of online applications that they get because we're now part of that group where you put a common with a common application and you can send it to as many colleges as you want. And we went from an average of 1,500 applications a year to, to 3,200 uh, over a short period of time. However, it did not increase enrollment. Uh, and so in order to maintain the enrollment of 400 new undergraduates every year, over that same period of time, our discount rate, what we charge has doubled in terms of how much, uh, how much we discount the cost of college. Um, 10 years ago, we had 400 freshmen in the fall and our discount rate was 35%. That means that people only paid 35% of the advertised cost through financial aid and grants and uh, endowment money. Uh, this past fall, we still had 400 undergraduates, but our discount rate is now 70%, which is not a sustainable business model. We're having to discount 70% on the of the advertised price to get the same number of students because not as many people want what we have. Uh, because we don't have STEM, we don't have engineering, we don't have computer science, we don't have a, a, a some of the more modern majors that students want. It's not, it's, it, it's about do people want your service? Uh, so our, our, two, our two case studies today, one is about you, you've got to answer to your funders no matter what, and you have to have metrics and data to do that. Your collection strategies today. Um, we we need qualitative data along with our quantitative. How do you get that? You did a very good job in that. Remember, don't don't beat them over the head with the quantitative up front. Um, you know, if you do that, you're not going to get very good qualitative data. That's kind of the takeaway on that one from interviewing. Um, if you're doing if you're doing interviewing. Please remember, if you're doing a sample of a, of a, of, of a larger population, your, your questions need to be consistent so they're comparable and you can generalize them to the larger, what you found to the larger 
organization. If you're doing the smaller, if you're doing the whole the whole organization, if there's only nine people, then you can you can do more of a perception interview where the questions kind of go wherever they go. You respond to what they said, and it's less structured. You have some structured questions, but the follow-ups can kind of go wherever you want them to go because you're not worried about trying to generalize that and and and, and look for themes throughout the entire organization because you've got you are interviewing the entire organization. So your your interview structure changes according to the, the, the population and sample issue, as I say every day. All of, all of life is just population and sample. And so you have to understand that. And then um, <clears throat> that that's the takeaway from, from interviewing for the qualitative piece is to make sure that your methodology in terms of your interviewing fits um, the population and sample that you're working with. Again, uh, when you're when you're looking at qualitative data, be careful to make sure, especially in a phenomenon, that you're looking at the entire phenomenon, um, not just the, the the marketing and the customer service, but also the actual product itself, how well it's received. Look at the entire process and not just pieces of it. So those are the takeaway from our case studies today. Uh, I appreciate your time today. I will see you. Dr. Scarlett and I will give her a chance. She does the benediction today, but we'll see you next Saturday morning. We'll have breakfast at nine. If you have specific biscuit orders, just email those to me, but we'll have breakfast next Saturday morning. Unless I hear anything different from the university, we're just at a heightened state of awareness now. We have not gone to a plan where we go online only. Um, we'll know before our meeting in May if that's the case. Dr. Scarlett, if you're with us, I see you're still with us. If you'd like to close this morning. Yeah, um, that was th those were really good presentations yeah. this morning. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay. Um, and so those were very good. You hit the major notes. Uh, yes. Again, thank you for your participation and make sure you put your uh, your presentation in the Dropbox along with your final reflection from today. Anything you'd like to add and I will see you. We'll see everybody next Saturday morning. Have a safe week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.